Bullshit. It's the No BS Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. Our guest today is Steve Agnoli. But first, let's hit the bullseye. It's natural to look at sales data, call reports, closing ratios, and other sales metrics on a regular basis. But it's important to remember that who you market to is different than who you sell to. Who you market to is different than who you sell to. One example is your employees. You need to focus on your employees as a key target market. In episode one, Steve talked about how important it is to communicate with the employees in his team, on his team, and across the entire organization. Companies need to realize that employees are a target market. They impact your brand and your sales. You need to educate and motivate employees so the marketing-oriented ones can help your cause And the average ones have a neutral rather than negative impact on your marketing, messaging, and branding. If you're not developing clear employee marketing campaigns, you risk the dissemination of misinformation. Employees are going to talk and tell stories about the company. You want to provide them as much information as possible so they can tell the real story rather than an inaccurate one. Remember that if you don't provide a clear message, they'll make one up. And that goes for policies, procedures, interactions with companies and clients, talking to their friends. You need to provide them the real story so they don't just make it up. Another key target market is referral sources, proving that who you market to is different than who you sell to. And I'm not talking just about healthcare where referral sources are a common thing. Every industry benefits from referrals by people who believe in the company, product, or service. Make referral sources a clear target market. Track them diligently. Ask current customers for referrals. Ask vendors and strategic partners if they refer to you and why or why not. Use Net Promoter Score, which has them rank on a scale of 1 to 10 how likely they are to refer to you. And listen and adjust. Then market your message to your referral source target market. Employees, referral sources, and many other Target markets prove that you might not sell to everyone, but who you market to is different than who you sells to, who you sell to. In order to hit the bullseye, you got to remember that who you market to is different than who you sell to. The No BS Show is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash no BS. Try a book like The Creator's Code, The Six Essential Skills of Extraordinary Entrepreneurs by Amy Wilkinson. Great book. Creator's Code, The Six Essential Skills of Extraordinary Entrepreneurs, author Amy Wilkinson. You can download it for free today. Go to audibletrial.com slash no BS for your free audiobook. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Our guest today is Steve Agnoli, Chief Information Officer at Reed Smith, a international law firm. Steve's responsible for firm-wide IT strategy, systems and technology operations, process improvement, and support for growth activities. Companies Steve served as CIO were recognized as top 100 companies internationally by CIO Magazine for using IT for positive business transformation. Steve was also named the inaugural Global CIO of the Year by the Pittsburgh Technology Council in 2005. Steve, welcome to the show. Dave, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. Steve, I guess a couple of things. First is hit the bullseye targeting. I talked about who you market to is different than who you sell to and how important that is. Your thoughts? You know, I, in my business, um, we do have a big marketing component or so, I guess it's not sales, but marketing component, let's say. And that is that we have to prove value all the time to our internal users and in our business to external users, our clients. And so, you know, the industry these days has a lot of alternatives. There are optional other ways to do IT. And so we as an IT group have to prove our value to our firm because they have options. And um, we want to make sure that the job we do is the best job that's possible and way, way better than any of the competitors in that space. So we have to market ourselves. So it's not just, you know, keeping the, the trains running or the technology up. It's proving the value of having us there because of our knowledge, our knowledge of our business, and making that clear, uh, communicating to our senior management on a regular basis as to what we've accomplished, how that mat- you know, how that was done and why that matters. 
And we also have a component to be able to, to reach the marketplace and say, our firm can provide these extra value adds from a technology perspective that are good for you. Um, you know, it helps the overall business. And so we're, we're kind of engaged in marketing, uh, maybe not in the traditional sense, but certainly in getting the word out and keeping that word out there as to what we can do, what we provide, and why that matters. And I think that's important to talk about on this show, which really focuses on leadership, communication, messaging. As a leader in technology, you know and you live the communication mantra. And I think that each industry has its own stereotype, whether it's accounting, finance, bean counters, marketers, schlocky salespeople, um, IT, tech, techies. No matter which discipline you're in, you have to be a strong communicator as a leader. That's, that's absolutely right, both internally and externally. You know, because you have to keep your your team motivated. You have to keep things moving forward, certainly. And you know, nobody likes to to work in the dark, right? So you have to you have to do that internally. But I also think there's a huge component, even for let's call them internal functions, which you know, IT or accounting, HR, et cetera. You know, you could call it that. Um, you know, there's an external component to all of that as well, and you need to prove value, either incremental value or direct value you know, revenue producing type value, either one. Um, it's, a, it's a key component these days and it's a differentiator in the marketplace. And, um, you know, without it, you're, it, it's a lot tougher. Steve, in the first episode, you talked about your career journey, your path. And one thing that I found interesting, I want to start this episode off with is you, your first job. You said you went to IUP Eberly College of Business and Information Technology and you come out and you get a job. And you, you mentioned, uh, I think it was COBOL, which I hadn't heard that term since IUP. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so that you were a programmer. And then you mentioned that you weren't necessarily a good programmer. Mm -hmm. So talk about the mental process that happened. Because someone listening might be in that spot. They're 23, 24. And they went to college, got their degree, started and went, whoa, this isn't what drives mm -hmm. me. Talk about how you process that and what you did about it. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a great question. You know, as I said earlier, you know, I, I knew that, so to speak, the heavy technical wasn't for me. Um, it just wasn't exciting. Um, I wasn't particularly good at it and uh, I didn't enjoy it. The days were pretty long. But in those circumstances, be they meetings or interactions with others, I felt differently about those kind of things. And so I kind of put two and two together and almost did a little inventory and said, okay, well, what do I like and what do I not like about this whole working for a living thing? And was able to come up with the fact that I liked the interactions and I liked being able to tell and, and work with people on solving their problems. So I knew what I liked, kind of knew what I didn't like. I didn't want to throw away all my schooling and, you know, the jobs I had or the job I had. So how could I kind of blend those two together? And, and so what it came down to was looking at, okay, how do I progress towards the end game, the goal, which was to be more on the business side of IT than the technical side of IT. Um, and so my path, I looked at some options and, you know, the path was through the systems analysis side as well as in getting a, a master's degree in, in business. And those two things kind of coming together, I thought, you know what, I'll be better prepared to move into roles that have that kind of business component. And so I tried to you know, look forward a little bit and see what, how I might be able to make that thing happen. And that's, that's what I did. I think a key takeaway is whether you're in HR, whether you're in operations, IT, finance, your point about saying, I wanted to understand how to apply the business side of that rather than the technical side. The same could be said of someone who's in HR right now, mm -hmm. being an HR person that's an HR specialist or whatever, and they're focusing on one task of recruitment or whatever, they can apply your same lesson Absolutely. and become learn the business side of it and become a, a leader. And I think that's an important takeaway. Then you move from the programmer and what was your next spot? After kind of, again, moving through that systems analysis phase, I became a consultant. Because again, I thought next step would be to actually be more involved directly with the business or outside businesses, clients. Uh, and that's where that year 2000 consulting came in. And, you know, the good thing there was in order to understand the impact of technology, you have to understand how it's used within the business. And consulting is a great way to do that, right? You have to understand the business. You need to, you know, they always say, if you're a consultant, you need to go in and talk business. 
And then the other stuff comes from that. Know the business before you get there. Re, you know, read the annual report, all that kind of stuff. And I think that, you know, through that consulting experience, that that was kind of a, a really a launching pad uh, into the business side of things. Because you start to think about things differently. You you start to think about how does the business use these things? What these the impact of that versus how does this thing work? Both important, but different. How about from a messaging standpoint, the whole Y2K? You think about it, anybody over the age of 30, if you say Y2K, they think of 1999 and for a year, people talking about the doom and gloom that was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Messaging at its finest. Yeah, I guess. I guess. You know, in, in my time, I was actually a little bit before that. Um, and so we were just raising awareness of the issue for the most part. Certainly, there were some technical analysis and things like that that were going on. But we were, you know, in the marketing mode, so to speak, to say, hey, there might be a problem. You might want to take a look at this. And so from a consulting standpoint, uh, we spent a lot of time in education. And I think that's a key component of all of this, right? You need to have an informed audience and be informed yourself to be able to, to be credible. And in that case, you know, there was a lot of education that needed to go on just to understand or to, to kind of raise awareness. So we were very early on in that process. So educate me a little bit and hopefully some of our audience. What was predicted to happen and didn't happen and why when the clock turned midnight? The, um, the, the, in the old days, when we were in college, um, computer coding was done in such a way that um, disk was very expensive, and so you you tried to use as little as possible. And so what happened was people didn't use the full four character year. They would use the last two digits. And so, um, you know, 1975 was 75. And the concern was that when the year 2000 came, you would be, you know, 99 and it become zero, zero. And the computer wouldn't know whether it was 1900 or 2000. That's an oversimplification, but that's pretty much what the issue was. And mm-hmm. so concern was that the computers would just – either they'd stop working or they'd give unpredictable results and you'd be in big trouble. Um, and, and it was all really based on the fact that disk storage was very expensive and people didn't think that far ahead that this would be an issue. And so it was really kind of a – and it, a lot of it was an analysis issue of – Am I going to have a problem? Where's my systems and am I going to have a problem? And then the second was, if I am going to have a problem, how do I fix it? And so what we saw through that whole process was people got a much better understanding of what their infrastructures, computing infrastructures were like because they had to go in and look and find stuff, which they didn't have to do before. They kind of took things for granted. Now they had to actually go find it test it. And in many cases, you saw a lot of upgrades being done because people thought, well, I might have a problem. I better just get new stuff that doesn't have this this issue built in. And so you saw a lot of building a strong foundation to do computing tasks after that. And that's one of the benefits of this whole thing. People might say, well, it cost us a lot of money that I didn't have to spend. Fair enough. But in other ways, you could look at it and say, it gave us a stronger foundation on which to collect data, report, uh, do some analytics, and build a, uh, you know, a, a more robust kind of platform to move so forward. So there's no way that everybody upgraded. So what happened to the ones that didn't upgrade and nothing bad happened? Or? I can, you know, I can speak to uh, my particular firm at the time. We had, um, I think it was one system. It was a um, typing system that people used to test how fast people could type. And it worked on December 31st and it didn't work on January 1st. That was really the only problem that we had. So there wasn't widespread pandemonium or, you know, um, there was concern of vital infrastructure, so, you know, water systems and sewage systems and electrical power and things like that. That really didn't come. Now, there were some remediations done. So it's hard to say for sure. If we wouldn't have done those remediations through the Y2K process, would there have been an issue? Maybe. But I think the, the kind of the, the general thought is that it was a, a bit more than, than was maybe necessary. Would you say that uh, they fixed it so that now there's like five digits? So in year ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine, they might have a scare. I think uh, I think we're okay on that front. <laughs> <laughs> we're listening to the No BS Marketing Show. I'm your host Dave Mastovich, and I'm with Steve Agnoli. Steve, I talk a lot about when I read Simon Sinek's book about start with why. I felt that that was great for entrepreneurs and CEOs to 
ask why, their why, their reason for being. And we went through that at Mass Solutions, and I explained to everyone on our team why I started the company, what my passion was. But I also know that what the, my why of why I started the company was that when I sat on the other side in the C-suite of multi-billion dollar companies, and then I would talk to friends who worked at smaller companies and mid-sized companies, I wondered why their marketing stunk. And I believe that uh, I take the Steve Ells line, he, he formed Chipotle, he said, because sustainably raised foods should not be an elitist pursuit, that anyone should be able to eat sustainably raised foods. I believe that good marketing, real marketing, no BS marketing shouldn't be an elitist pursuit. Every company should be able to have no BS marketing. That's my why, but my customers sometimes don't care about that. They just have their why, and that's their reason for buying. So I say there are two whys, your why, your reason for being, and their why, your customer's why, their, their reason for buying. And then you have to coalesce those two into a message because they aren't the exact same answer. You have to have a message that can be melded together into one big idea, one memorable message or theme that makes an emotional impact on target audiences. So whether it's for you personally, your team, or Reed Smith, what's the big idea? Yeah, I think the big idea for us in the IT group at, at Reed Smith is that we need to align our IT capabilities with business imperatives. So our driver is not IT. You know, our driver is where's our firm headed and how can we help it get there? Um, you know, I'm always reminded of a uh, an anecdote that someone once said that, you know, I think it was they were referring to Black & Decker. And they said, you know, no one wants three eighths inch drill bits, but everybody wants three eighths inch holes. And, you know, I think that's important for us. In our world, the technology itself doesn't matter. Um, you know, sometimes the best technology is the latest and greatest stuff. And sometimes the best technology is a tablet and a pencil. And for us, you know, the, our firm looks to us to help them make those kind of decisions. And make the right decisions in that regard. So we're not caught up in what the technology is. We have the latest and greatest stuff. We have to. But it's really how do we use that for value? How do we align the things that we're doing from a technology perspective to where the firm is headed and assisting it to get there? So, you know, in my, my book, I think that's really where the coalescing, as you said, of the two come together. What do we need to do? Where's the firm headed? And how do we make sure those two things come together? What's a competitive advantage that you feel... Reed Smith's technology and your team has brought to Reed Smith over, we don't have to pick a competitor by name, but competitor A, who's also international, competitor B, who's maybe not international, but still pretty big. Yeah. What's, what's a competitive yeah. advantage your technology brought? I think there's a couple things. One is that we focus on not only the in-house stuff, but adding value through technology with our clients. That's the first thing. I think that's a differentiator in the marketplace. We're certainly not the only firm that does that, but firms that do that are better positioned than the firms that don't. That's for sure. Um, we have, you know, the capability to do that. I think that's, you know, a differentiator factor. A lot of people talk about it. And we have a firm that thinks that's important. And that's a big difference. Not all firms think that. Not all firms look at technology as a differentiator. But if the firm thinks that and you're able to deliver on that, I think that's a, that's a, that's a strong competitive differentiator in the market. Talk to me about your clients, because I'm going to assume your clients are mostly really large companies. For the most part, yeah. So would a BD person at Reed Smith, how would they sell your technology to a potential new big mm -hmm. client? You know, uh, one of the approaches that we take is we talk with our clients about a legal issue. And as, we're, as we as a firm are talking about them, we have other folks in the room so if there's the attorneys talking about the legal issue, but we also use that as an entree for our, what we call our client value function, which is providing analytics and additional data about the actual engagement itself. Our knowledge management function, who are looking at the resources and knowledge assets that we have and how can we apply those in new and different ways within the engagement. Our IT, um, we're represented there as well. So we come into these meetings, not just the lawyers, but also the, let's call them the peripheral, the value add functions that say, hey, we think our engagement with you, we think our relationship with you is not just solving the legal problem. That's a that's the big part for sure. But we can bring this other stuff to the table as well that's to your benefit, adds to efficiency, adds to effectiveness, adds value. Um, and so we're, we're looking at things more from a holistic perspective of 
client value than just solving the legal problem. Certainly have to do that. So I think we approach it a little bit differently. And so when we pitch something, it's not just here's the legal solution. It's also here's the other things that can add value that we can provide. And sometimes you might pick them and frankly, sometimes you might not. But we're there, you know, we have multiple, let's call them services or products that we're able to offer and, you know, give, give some uh, choice and it actually gives some, some extra value there. Pick a success throughout the career. It could be Reed Smith. It could be 10 years ago. It could be 15 years ago. One of your favorite successes that were tied to both technology, I guess to three things, technology, leadership, and communication. So when you worked on some sort of project that was in your sweet spot of technology, but you had to lead and still communicate a message and it can be anything. It could be, I built a team in, at this company, I had to hire seven directors and five managers and my mantra was this, or it could be, we had a campaign to get to the point of implementing a new system and we had to communicate that across a company, across countries. Mm -hmm. What's a a success that implies leadership, technology, and communication? I'll give you a very recent example. We recently won um, an award from the British Legal Awards for the best use of technology. And this was a particular application system that we built that helps with deal closings. And the reason it's so important is, well, certainly it's a good system get a lot of value out of that. Um, but from a leadership standpoint, what it, it shows is that our practice area, our knowledge management function, and our IT function all worked together to come up with a solution that brings client value. So it wasn't just an IT thing that was, hey, let's just put this together and people love it or you know, practice group kind of thing. We, we were dependent on each other to get that to, to go. The other component is that it it really allowed us to compete very strongly with smaller firms who may have different cost structures because this, this process is now so efficient that we are able to use not only good technology, but staff lawyers at different rates to bring a really quality decision or quality end product that's enabled by technology that, you know, if we didn't have that, our cost structure may have been problematic or prohibitive. But because the technology brings these various areas together and the knowledge together, it allows us to compete differently. So now our clients that have this, this kind of need can come to us, a big firm with a tremendous amount of knowledge, a tremendous amount of expertise and experience, and do it at a, at a cost that is comparable to maybe a firm who doesn't have that expertise and doesn't have that knowledge. So, you know, I think, again, from a leadership standpoint, we brought together the, the, the parties and moved it forward and completed it. Um, but from a value standpoint, it speaks to how we can market ourselves differently and how we compete differently because of a technology and knowledge solution that wasn't in place before. That's Steve Agnoli. I'm Dave Mastovich. You're listening to the No BS Marketing Show. Brought to you by Mass Solutions, a marketing firm that focuses on bold solutions, no BS. Steve, listeners want to know, do you have a tool, an app, blog, book, (laughs) or even something that's part of your daily or weekly routine that impacts your life and might help our listeners? I think there's two things there, Dave. I have a um, Bible verse app on my phone that uh, pops up a reminder once a day and that keeps me grounded. And then there's a book that I've had for, I don't know, 20 years. It's called Quotable Business. And it's just a listing of quotes in different categories. And some of them are very insightful. Some of them are hilarious. But they're always very interesting and they're very helpful uh, in presentations and things, but also just to kind of get you to th- think about things a little differently. So my, my uh, you know, if I had to walk out of uh, my office with one, uh, one book under my arm, it would be the quotable business book. Throw one out there. Throw one of your oh, favorite geez. quotes out there. Oh boy. That's a, that's a good, um, I have to think about that one. The, the only one I can think of, and this one has got me in trouble before is um, um, Al Capone once said that you can get more with a kind word and a gun than you can with just a kind word. <laughs> See, that's why that book's worth it, because like you said, some of them are just pure fun, and some of them are like the John Wooden quotes. Uh, I, I get a lot of these uh, quotes come to me because I do a lot of coaching, so I'll get 
newsletters and so forth. And they have all these quotes from John Wooden and Pat Riley and Phil Jackson. And a lot of the sports quotes are always pretty good, but I love when you get a funny one like that. So Steve, when you were coming on to the show and we, we talked a lot beforehand and you and I got to know each other a little bit through Indiana University of Pennsylvania, Business Advisory Council and so forth. Coming in the show, sometimes guests are a little bit apprehensive because of the title of the show and that I'm a little bit wacky. <laughs> was there anything you thought we'd cover that we didn't? And if, or is there anything else you'd like to close with that, uh, to tell our audience? You know, and I think, uh, you did a great job. This has been an enjoyable <laughs> experience. Um, no, I have nothing. I have nothing I think, uh, to add. Excellent. So thanks for being here, Steve. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And to our listeners, thanks for joining us for the No BS Marketing Show. Visit massolutions.biz slash bold solutions for show notes plus additional marketing and messaging resources. Sign up for light reading. You'll receive valuable strategies every week to improve your marketing and transform your message. It really is light, intended to be read in two minutes or less, and it just might trigger bright ideas for you. To sign up, visit massolutions.biz. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions.